from time to time, Linux can seem a bit scary to people, and they're worried about running Linux servers, and what about the commands, and the command line seems a little foreign to me. I want something I can click on. I understand all those arguments. Uh, the purest to me is always, you know, uh, as they call the old gray beard, so you should use everything from the command line. But I'm, uh, I, and I, I know not every Linux sysadmin agrees with me, but I think tools like Webmin come in pretty handy. And especially for things like setting up an iSCSI initiator, I don't really always remember the command line to do things I infrequently do. So although I spend a lot of time on the command line, I still think Webmin is a good resource uh, for especially new system administrators who want to start using Linux and have a nice dashboard, but even people like me who have been using Linux for years, I think Webmin has its place. Now, I know one complaint that I will address right up front. Yes, Webmin can mangle some of the files uh, in like Apache, the config files, because it uses its own structure for them. So some sysadmins don't like the structure Webmin may create if you create new config files with it. Uh, but I, on the other side of it, it actually makes them kind of easy to read uh, from Webmin. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, there's going to be some type of comments and below arguments for and against this. But in uh, what I really want to cover today is not that topic at all, but just Webmin itself and how you can use it as a sysadmin uh, to help understand your Linux servers and how it works. Now, I will comment quickly. I did try Cockpit because I've had a couple people suggest it. It's like Webmin in development. Uh, I, I think they get a cool concept with Cockpit. I did load it. It just is missing all the features that Webmin has. So it feels like a project that's trying to catch up with Webmin. I know it's built differently than Webmin, but that being said, uh, Webmin still has like a full feature set uh, versus the basic feature set. So maybe I'll do one on Cockpit, but I play with it, and I'm I'm sorry, I'm not real impressed with it. It's just very basic. Uh, it's another it's another web based administration tool, very similar to Webmin. I, I'm not, you know, there's always different opinions in open source, and they went a different route, and it's supported by Red Hat. It does have some nice features, but I'm not going to dwell on it. First, getting Webmin. I was going to show you from the Webmin website. It's down. Uh, <laughs> this bad timing. I noticed it was down last night. I checked this morning, it's still down. I don't know why it's down. Uh, but they host on SourceForge. I cringe a little when I see things hosted on SourceForge, but uh, I think they've cleaned up their site and they're not as bad as they were. They just had, that's a whole different discussion. You download it from here. I'm doing all this in Debian. Uh, that's my preferred environment, but it does support lots of other environments. So you can use this in other platforms, but everything I'm going to do is be Debian-centric. So just take that for what it's worth. Actually, Webmin is helpful if I'm using it in a non-Debian environment, because things like package updates, I'm just not good with. I use uh, RPMs very sparingly, so I'm not as good in Red Hat. Uh, that's actually something this fixes, because Webmin creates a common web interface to do package updates, whether you're in Red Hat or in a Debian environment. So let's get started. Download link here. Not that exciting. I've already downloaded it. Uh, there's wget, however you want to get it. Uh, get it into the command line of your server. I am SSH'd into the server here. It does not have Webmin running right now. Let me move my face out of the way. So there's our Webmin file. Now, first thing we're going to do is uh, dpackage. And like I said, we're in dev environment, dash i for install, and Webmin. And this is one of the reasons I like Debian environments. I always like to plug this. I know it probably works similar in CentOS and some of the other Red Hat versions. But for example, dpackage error prop is leaving unconfigured because it couldn't find a few things. No big deal. apt get install. Dash F just means find all the packages, force and find all the packages that uh, were missing and install them. Because what it is is Webmin has other packages that are needed to get it up and running. Um, and dpackage doesn't install. So we just do this. And I know someone's going to say, yeah, you can string the two things together and make it all work as one. I know. I just did it separate so I can explain this for the video. In case you're wondering, you, you can do dpackage, then apt install ff, all is one command. It'll just do the whole thing at once. But the setup is really simple on here. It adds a few Perl modules because it's based in the back end of it's in Perl. So it needs that for security. And by default, it's all SSL. It lets you know the server name. So Webmin is all complete. You can now log in at uh, your server name, colon 10,000. That's the default port for this. A default username and password is going to be whatever your root server name and password is. I'm going to get this out of the way and let's log in. Now, as usual, you're greeted with a, because it's a self-signed certificate, so you're greeted with the security warning. Um, you can proceed, or if you're familiar with how to do this in Chrome, you can type bad idea and it goes in. 
then we're going to log in with our password. Now, I don't really, unless you have a super strong password and you're feeling really confident, uh, I don't recommend leaving Webmin public facing until you at least get some two-factor under, but generally, don't believe things like this public facing. It offers a lot of control with username and password. Uh, normally, my uh, security method, if I need something publicly accessible, is turning off uh, interactive login on SSH and locking it down so only you can log in with keyed authentication, so using SSH keys. I'm going to do a video on that soon, uh, but if you're in Windows and want to know how to use SSH, uh, SKH, look up Willie How He has a video on how to do it in Windows. My video is going to be completely Linux-based because that's where I admin from. All right, so we start out, we're at the dashboard and you get this spiffy dashboard that tells you memory usage, CPU usage, local disk usage, uh, time, date, host name, recent logins, which is gonna be just me, this login right now, it tells you uh, right there. And pretty slick, uh, basic setup. Now, there's all the different modules and we're gonna start going through all these and how you set uh, different things up. But we'll go over here and start inside of Webmin itself. Now you may notice, and I'm gonna point it out over here, a little bell over here. This is for things like package updates, notifications, which can come through the browser, which is kind of cool when you log in. Um, you can send browser notifications. Now the basics, we got backup configuration, change language and themes, so you can play with theme and UI. I like the default one, uh, but there's options. Uh, Web action log, this is kind of cool because uh, if you have more than one admin, you can set up multiple uh, logins or have more people logging in here, and it logs the changes, and then you can have a action list of those things that were done in here, pretty cool. Especially if you're working in a shared environment or you just don't remember what you clicked on. <laughs> now this is cool because there's a lot of stuff in here. IP access control, ports and addresses. It lets you customize Webmin, whether or not you want it to start at boot time, restart the Webmin package itself. Uh, it is self-updating and it, well, not really self-updating, but it lets you know when there's an update so you can load it and you don't have to leave Webmin to load it. So it loads and uh, the only thing you may notice if you, after it loads, while it's installing the update, um, Webmin becomes unavailable and you think, oh no, I'm getting a page not display, but after a few minutes, it generally starts back up. I, over the years, there's been times when I've had to restart Webmin from the command line, but it's pretty rare, and it's just a service that starts. There's nothing special about how it runs. It runs like any other service. Now, like I said, it does support two-factor, so you can use Google Authenticator, Authy. Uh, it's got both those in there, so it supports TOTP authentication from your phone. Definitely, uh, if you're worried about security, please set that up. Uh, different modules, you can load custom modules. I, I don't know how many third-party modules are anymore. I don't use any of them, but uh, for a while I know there was a bunch of different third-party modules you can get. And like I said, you can play with the themes, titles, uh, categories on the side. You can regroup things together. Uh, server options itself, so how all this works and how it caches static files. You can really get in here and tweak all of it. I generally, other than adding two-factor um, and authentication and maybe changing default port because it's default to 10,000, so people may be just looking at that inside your network and going, oh, look, I found a webman. Not that security through obscurity is great, but it's, it stops some of the script kiddies, maybe. <laughs> um, so you turn on two-factor, everything else. By default, it starts in SSL. I, I don't know when they made that change because I remember years ago it didn't, uh, and you used to have to switch to that, but it, all that stuff, like I said, the default works pretty fine. Uh, it does have an option, and I don't use this, but you can group servers together in cluster them, so you can actually uh, have it search the network for other webmin servers to make it easy to jump between them. I just bookmark each server that I have it running on. Uh, you can configure by default, it's gonna pull from the user list inside there, uh, which is great for uh, the logins, but you can add more. Uh, you convert women users to Unix users, uh, vice versa, you've got other options uh, in here if you wanna set up different systems for that. I generally, because you're just controlling things as root, but if you have other users, you can uh, do as you please. Now let's get into the meat and potatoes of this. System, boot up and shut down. This is something that a lot of people struggle with. What starts at boot? What? How do I turn that off? Um, how do I handle all that? And it's especially a learning curve when you're doing there, but this is what's kind of common. We can actually look at Webmin itself as a service. So we click on it. And save and start, does it start at boot time? No, uh, because it has its own starter, this one's set to no, but you can stop now, start now, save and start at boot. You can set those options for any modules that are running. So you can see them here, you can sort them. Start at boot always, start at boot yes. Running now, no, but it starts, and these are different things, like it tries to run these tools here. So this is really easy if you go, okay, I want to, let's go look at something that starts at boot. 
Here's the app to get upgrade service, start a boot. We can say start now, restart now. It's kind of cool. This is kind of an easy way to manage some of those things. Uh, and you can also create new services. So if you wanted a service to start, easy enough to just go ahead and create that service and it'll create system D services. So I kind of like the way you can handle it through a web interface um, and see what's running and not running and needs to be run. Uh, changing passwords for each of the uh, users, it does have that as an option, so you can change the passwords. No big deal there, pretty simple. Disk and network file system, this is really handy. Uh, so if you want to see how to set up a mount, you can, and this is something that, uh, uh, it can be confusing at times of how to set this up, and I've got just a really nice system for uh, setting up the parameters. So you want to mount a Linux native file system, uh, you want to do an NFS mount, an NFS4, EXT4, HPFS, all the different ones in here. Uh, it does have uh, Xbox in here. Now, you may have noticed, for example, CIFS is missing from here, which is your common uh, internet file system. I could be wrong about the acronym. It's those Samba mounts. And you notice, hey, maybe that's not in here. This is what's kind of cool about the way Webmin works. So uh, not in here, but how do I mount a Samba share? Well, let's bring you over to a terminal. And there's going to be two ways to do this, but I'm going to start with the terminal. So we're going to app get install. Now you just know the module name is CIF Utilities. We're going to go ahead and load this and say yes. All right, now it adds the CIFS Utilities. What do we have to do in here? We're just going to go over here, change passwords. I'm going to click back over back onto disk and network file system, set the pull down. There it is. Now I can add a mount type of CIFS. It reads from the system, not Webmin, and looks at what's installed without doing anything other than refreshing that page and determines what utilities you have loaded. So if you wanted to load other modules in there, uh, Webmin pulls from the system in its current state. So you don't really have to do anything to tell Webmin, I added a new, I want to be able to mount a CIFS and be able to um, add that module in there. You don't have to add a module to Webmin. You can just add it like that. So these obviously are the ones that came with this Debian system. And uh, as you just watched, I added CIFS. And the reason I said there's two ways to do it is because you can do it from the command line. But some of you are going, I don't know how to do things from the command line very well. We're going to get to that part here on package management. But if you're not sure the parameters of like a River, Ry, I'm sorry, Riser FS mount, you can do mount it as, save it mount, uh, control the disk. It shows all the disks. There's only one disk in here, so there's not a lot in here. Whether you want to do it by partition ID, only one partition. This is in my Zen server. Read only, allow all these little parameters that go into the FS tab are all in here. And for example, if you say save amount at boot, you have M tab and FS tab. And some of you are going, I don't know what those are. Well, perfect. This takes care of that. One is for real time when it's... Uh, Running in the FS tab is when it, on boot. So these are different ways you can save or don't save. So you can temporarily mount something, but you don't want it to mount every time the system boots. This is all in, like I said, some sysadmins think you're not learning enough, but sometimes you don't do these very often. You just have a system. You go, okay, I need to do a quick admin on this. I need to add something temporarily, like a USB drive to copy some files, and you're not sure how to do it from the command line. This will show up a USB drive on there. You can mount it as a directory, do your things that you want to do, and then unmount it without having to know all the parameters related to it. Uh, but it has a lot of different options in here for all the different MSOS ones, and we'll actually look at the root file system and it lets you control things here as well. So this is the already mounted one. You can see it's mounted as a LVM, but we can change the mount type if we wanted to. Uh, we can make it read only, allow users. Um, different, All your different options on there. If you have quota storage options, you're not sure to set those up, no problem. You can add those user only, group only, users and groups, and you can start configuring all the options. And it's going to write the config file out for you when you hit save. So it is really nice the way it gives you, like I said, a lot of the control for uh, lesser used functions because if you ask me how to set up a quota from the command lines, I haven't done that in so long, so I don't really do that on my servers um, because we're not, they're not multi-user. I would struggle and probably webmin would be the way I'd do it. Sorry, I may be losing some of my Linux credit here because I don't do that very often. Um, file system backup, you can add a directory, create some tar files. I still, that's a command line thing to me that I prefer. Log file rotation. Um, you can go through and edit the log file system manually, uh, but this is pulls from there. So let's look at how it does this. And it has nice little options of how to do it. Now, and I'll show you in the command line here. So here's all the different log rotate options. Uh, let's 
So here's what it looks like here. Let me back out. And here's what it looks like here. So let me find the apt one. So here's the history log. It says number of logs to keep 12. And this is what it looked like just as a reminder in here. So we see 12 and 12 monthly compress. And we'll just say, let's keep 16. Go here to save. And I refresh this and now it says 16. So pretty simple how it works. It just goes through and edits this. But now, like I said, you don't have to remember all the different uh, parameters for what you want to do and things like that. So it's, it, even for logger team, it's something I don't change very often. So Webman makes this really handy. If I'm not sure how to change something, I'm not sure what the commands mean, or, or you're not familiar with the command line editor. You can also edit global options, change the schedules, or just force the log rotation to run right now. Now, it does have PAM authentication support. I'm not gonna get in, in depth on that, but this is something else it does. You can handle how it changes password and how the PAM interacts. And if you're not familiar, just in general, uh, PAM is the Pluggable Authentication Module. Um, I always forget the acronym, but it's it's kind of a, way, a common way to handle passwords across uh, the system. But it's uh, support for that and controlling that's built in here. Running processes. Now I'm way better at, uh, I like HTOP. I think it looks a lot better. That's just HTOP and HTOP are my two favorite tools, generally HTOP, uh, for seeing processes, memory, CPU. But uh, cool, you can find them here. You can search through things and find uh, stuff. Kind of neat too though, because let's type this in. This is uh, a nice search feature. This is a little bit trickier and more advanced for the command line, but sometimes this is just a question you have when you're scanning your own systems. You go, what the hell runs on this port? Uh, whoops, one, oh, one, two, three, search. And you can see everything pulling off of port 10,000, which is, of course, the Webmin. Uh, that's a nice feature. So if you're not sure what's running on a port when you look at a machine uh, that you're on, you're like, okay, what runs in this port? What processes are tied to it? It gives you the ID and things like that. So it is kind of handy. Um, you can, the parameters like using more than CPU usage, these are all things you could do from the command line and start pulling and grepping, but it's actually kind of cool to be able to do it here so you can look for processes that are using more than, let's say, 10%. Do a search. Nothing's really using more than that. One percent, maybe. I'd have to pin it to find that process. Let's just do that real quick. Let's. Uh, I think it's stress is the tool I want. Yes. Oh, good. It's in here. So uh, stress. Yeah, this is dash s cp. U1. All right, so that should pin the CPU. Do this. And all right, and we can see that we have this process just sucking up CPU time. And then if we want, and I have it over here, you can see it's still running and it's pinning the CPU. So let's go ahead and kill that process. And you can see it failed here because we killed it. So it's actually kind of neat for being able to do that because it, it gives you some nice uh, tools to go, you know, take a look at the server, quickly use the web interface to go, hey, I just want to see what's going on and uh, find these. So it's it's a nice, I like the running process. I've used it to help troubleshoot a little bit because it's sometimes a little bit faster than doing it from the command line unless you're just a command line wizard. Schedule cron jobs, uh, setting up cron jobs. They're fun, um, and they, you can easily goof up a cron job. I have goofed up a few in a day before I have learned it, but for new users especially, figuring out what all this means from the command line, and let's just do a command line that cron job. Looking at this, I mean, it's month day. This is the how you set up a cron job and how you have it running. And you can see that because I was actually, well, so I actually still have something called copy video to free NAS from another demo I was doing. So you can see how it sets up cron jobs and you're like, wait, what's the star mean? What's the five mean? I recommend you learn it. You may not learn it because you don't set them up very often. Then you can do things like this. And this is where you can set up cron jobs. And actually, let me see, is that one in here? It sure is. This says hourly on Every at the uh, fifth minute mark, I said five minutes. I didn't mean that. It's actually uh, at five minutes in, at all hours, all days, all months, uh, at you know 105, 205, 305, etc. Run this cron job. That's actually kind of a cool thing that you can do on here. It's also got options, so you maybe want things to run, and we'll say selected. We don't want that to run on weekends, but we want it to run here. You can just hit the control key, and then we're going to hit save. 
And then we'll come back over here, Grand Top Dash L, and now we've got the changes here. So it was, as you've seen with the five star star star, now it's five uh, star star dash one five. That means run on those days. Like I said, cron can be a little bit tricky to learn because you have to set each of these, and I could have just put the one five there, but you're probably looking at this going, okay, that's hard. This is one of the things that Webman is really good at is uh, making that easy. Whoop. Typing's not easy now. <laughs> all right, so cron jobs, great feature of it. So you can see all the ones that are running, not just for one user, but all the global ones that are in the different directories. Because uh, this is like the cron daily directory, that's why it looks like that. But this is also, to me, it, it I learned cron from the command line by doing uh, Webmin years and years ago. This, this system's been around for a long, long time. Software package updates. This is kind of cool too because you can actually say, just say, yeah, check daily, hourly, weekly, uh, and run on a schedule, install security, install any updates, and boom, now it's going to set to run a schedule to check and automatically load security updates or just notify. You can actually have it notify you when an action is needed and there's an option in Webmin to have it send email notifications uh, in the configuration. Pretty straightforward. Uh, and it's kind of nice too because it you may want to install automatically security updates. And a lot of people do that because um, it's better to install them and potentially break something, in my opinion, versus don't install security updates and scroll when you get a chance. There's tons of unpatched systems out there. Now, you can install all the updates. That means whenever a module is an update and it's not security related, it's just a new version, uh, you can install that. And that can be a little bit more risky because sometimes new versions uh, have questions when you install them. This is why I try to do all of my updates I prefer to do from the command line. Uh, that way, if there's any updates or things like, hey, this is a deprecated function and you need update the config, you can say yes, you can interact with it or no to go fix it. So that's just a sysadmin opinion I have. Now, this is just for auto updates and you can search and look for things uh, that are in here. So one of them we installed, what was that called? Stress. Search. I think it shows that there's any package updates for available for that. I don't think there's anything in these updating because I just updated this before I loaded it. So let's get to the software packages themselves. So this is kind of cool. This lets you search for installed ones. And I'm gonna look at stress again. So this is the class, this is the thing that's installed. It's an AMD tool to impose load and stress on a computer system, pretty cool. Click on the package, it gives you list and falls, you can un uninstall it. Now I'm way uh, prefer command line for doing this, but if you're not sure how to install packages with command line, it does work through here. Like I said, my, my preference is, because you can do more interactive stuff with the command line, but uh, the nice thing is it will uh, install the dependencies and everything else in here. Now, this is also kind of cool. Let's say we want to load a web server on here. Now, there's two ways to uh, do this. If you know exactly the package name, you can just type it in and it'll install it. But if you only type in a partial package name, it's not going to. And this is something I like from the command line. So uh, apt get install MySQL is pretty fast. Can't find it. Well, it's because I didn't type in the complete command. And versus in the command line, I can just tab a couple times and uh, find the thing I'm looking for, and I'm like, okay, I want the server installed. So you can do that here if you know the name of it, and it's uh, package name. MySQL, oh, I gotta spell that right, oops. <laughs> or definitely won't install. Now we click install, and here we go. We're getting MySQL installed. It's also grabbing all the related dependencies and doing all the setup and the config and everything you need to get MySQL installed. And when it's all done, it's gonna give you a little summary. In case you're wondering, uh, MySQL is uh, called MariaDB server now, it's part of a change. But you can see some of the other packages that had to get installed with it. It does go ahead and figure out all the dependencies needed to make that happen. So here's all the package details. Here's an entire summary of each package that was installed. So here's the actual command output, which I like that it, it gives that in there. So this is what it looks like if I would have, would have installed it from the command line. Um, and then install complete, and then it does a nice summary here that's a little bit more easy to read if you're not familiar with things, and then you can return to the module list. Now, that's uh, pretty straightforward how that works, and you know, resync packages, upgrade module, all the other things in there, and we can also type in search apt and uh, it pops up. I don't know why it doesn't pull the name in there, but 
We'll do submit. And it can list the different patches, uh, packages with that in there and uh, that need it. So it's kind of, I don't know, I'm not thrilled with the way this works um, because it finds everything. And there's default MySQL server. And this is the actual command that installs it. Uh, and that can be a little bit confusing. To me, command line's better. But if you know the package's names, you can actually just type in the package name directly and install, and then it'll install it. So the search function, eh, it seems kind of mediocre. Uh, also, how we installed from dpackage command line, this actually lets you upload a file uh, from an FTP or URL and actually install deb packages directly. This is the D package that I actually use to install Webmin. Uh, but if you do have a deb package that's outside of the repository, yes, you can install it from here. Now, let's talk a little bit about, so uh, let's cover these real quick and I'm gonna jump down the servers. So just, it's got the man pages in here. So if you don't wanna uh, man page for something, let's see, what do we have? This, it just pulls up the man pages. Uh, so you can see and read them. Uh, find one for stress. There we go. So I can see all the command line stuff that I can do for stress uh, on here. So kind of neat. But that's the documentation in here. So it'll search through things. System logs. This is so you can view the logs. The other one was so we can do the log file rotation and set up. It's, uh, let's look at the auth log view log file, let you search for things in here, last 20 and configure it. So it's kind of just basically view the logs, the same thing that's, most of these are all in var log, but you can also uh, view specific log files if you have ones you want to put in here. Uh, right here, like var webmin, and we can just go view the webmin log file. Not much in here. Users and groups. Uh, if you want to add users, it's kind of cool. It does let you do that on here. Now, if I didn't mention it up here in the corner, any module, there's a module config for uh, in case you want to modify it. It looks into default places for things. So generally, the module config doesn't really need to be used much. Only if you've decided that or you have a weird system and it's not installed where it expects things to be installed. Uh, if you're advanced in doing things like that, probably you're not using Webbin anyways. So generally, you never have to click that. But this allows you to edit the users, edit their home drive, pre-encrypt a password, normal password, uh, choose which shell they have. Uh, kind of neat. It lets you set this up in here. So it's kind of handy if you're adding a bunch of users to a system uh, and you want to create a new user, you can do all that. So you can it'll find all the shells that are currently installed, uh, SBIN, no log, and bin sync, uh, and all the parameters related to that user. So that's built in. Now let's get to the servers part. Now this is the servers as in which servers are installed. And you're probably saying, hey, didn't you just install MySQL server? It's not in there. Correct. So we're gonna go to refresh modules. Then we're gonna click on servers. Hey, look, there's the MySQL database server. Anytime you make changes uh, to the, system, the underlying system itself and load something, you want to refresh modules. Refreshing modules is what gets you the updated uh, servers in this list here, the updated modules. Right now, unused modules. So like Apache Web Server is an unused module. So it doesn't show up in here. So MySQL read in there. So let's show you real quick. Let's uh, bring in the command lines. So it's just faster. But yes, I know we could type uh, in webmin just like we did before, but we're gonna app get install Apache 2. Yep, say yes. And there we go, Apache 2 is installed. Refresh modules. There we go, Apache web server. Done. Create virtual host. Set the document root, set the name, start messing with it. Uh, I'm not gonna cover every module, but in short, uh, for every module you load, it brings up a whole parameters file uh, for these. That's kind of the, if it had any existing virtual hosts, you'd be able to edit them. Um, and this is what it looks like when you edit, log files, document options, error handling, alias redirect, CGI. It's, it's pretty extensive uh, for handling uh, Apache, it's extensive for uh, MySQL database server. You can set up user permissions, database permissions, table permissions, not as advanced as a PHP MyAdmin if you haven't used that. A lot of people like it. It's a web interface for MySQL. I use it. Uh, MySQL is 
Um, only as good as I can find on Stack Exchange when I'm doing stuff to write a query. I'm not the best at SQLs. I just don't use it very often. Um, I can kind of get by in PHP. Uh, my admin is my go-to tool for that. But just for viewing uh, what's inside of a table and seeing the databases, yeah, it works. Uh, I'm not. It's not near as powerful as PHP my admin uh, for managing databases. But just in general, want to create a database uh, or do any of that? No problem. You can. Uh, create new database. You know, it's it's pretty basic, but it lets you do some of the basics on there. Like I said, so creating users inside of here, you can get the basics done. Database connections uh, shows connections that are connected to it. Like I said, there's a lot of modules they support. So anything that we add in here, you can easily uh, add the modules. Matter of fact, we'll add one more thing in here because something that a lot of people ask is, I want to set up file sharing on my Linux server. No problem. Samba is the file sharing tool of choice. So Samba is now loaded. Refresh the modules again. There we go. Samba's installed, and we can start playing with setting up the file shares, the home directories, all the functions. Now, this is all, of course, controlled through the uh, SMB comp file and Etsy. Um, so it's a little bit tricky setting up Samba shares if you haven't done it before. This makes it a whole lot easier, I will admit. Uh, I, you know, I understand the command line for Samba, but this is just so much nicer for being able to set up the Samba shares and things like that uh, because there's a lot of parameters for Samba. There's a lot of options in here. There's a lot of tie together for how you set up the users, synchronizing the users and groups. There's a lot of configuration, and Webmin does support all of uh, the features in there to completely get your Samba server up and running and do a lot of configuration on it. Now, because I most of my servers run headless and, uh, well, I, all of them do, uh, and SSH, if I took the time to learn, because I don't load web in on everything, uh, how you configure SSH, and I may do this like a securing SSH tutorial, so when I set up a little node in the cloud for someone, uh, I generally just leave SSH, the most basic things and whatever utility you need running uh, on there. For example, when I set up Unify servers, just don't need anything else but the but SSH and the Unify software, so you keep the server. It's, it's least amount of tools running means the least amount of security risk. Um, so, I configure it from the command line, but you can, from here, uh, do the same things, which is kind of cool. So use authorized key file, uh, allow login by root. I have it set to yes on this, permit empty logins. Authentication by password is currently set to yes, but like I said, when you're setting up a server and you want it secure, you want to set that to no. And this will go ahead and edit the configuration, and we apply changes. And this goes throughout all of them. Uh, you change configuration file, then you apply the changes, and if there's any output, it'll actually tell you. SSH key setup, it actually has a lot of these features in there that how to set the key files and the key types and things like that. So it's, it is handy for any of these. Any of the modules I found have been fairly extensive and let you really get in there and configure things. Someone asked about configuring mail servers. I don't really run any self-hosted mail servers anymore, but I will show you this. Uh, Postfix, there we go. So Postfix is the really common mail server. And I have one Postfix server that I still maintain, but like I said, I, I, I've, even if you look, my Lawrence Systems email is going into the cloud. It's a G Suite email address. It's too difficult running your own mail servers, and I don't find it overly worth it anymore. But if you get determined to do this, and I don't know that I'll ever really do a video on it, maybe, I don't know, depends on the demand, uh, the Postfix configuration in here is really nice. Um, the Postfix server at mail, because I just don't admin it very anymore. I've moved it to using uh, this on top of it because there's a lot of parameters in setting up a mail server in this day and age, including gray listing and all the other features. Um, so there's a lot to config and maintain and make sure that it works and not and just to do some level of spam management, this has good support for configuring all those configuration files because the Postfix configuration is extensive to get it set up and working well. I mean, you can get it set up and just working, but do you want it working well? If you're trying to maintain a mail server, there's a lot of parameters on there. I recommend using PostGray along with Postfix and uh, Webmin, like I said, because you can see how many modules there are for here. There's a lot of things to control and set up on there. Uh, 
Also, you notice read user mail is in here as well. So when you're setting it up, kind of a cool thing, if you have it set up on here, uh, it will allow you to go through and read the user mail. Um, it also supports Dovecot. So, and that's a IMAP server, because how do you get the mail off there? Load Dovecot, how do you uh, use a web interface on there? Well, pick one of the many web interfaces and load them on top of there, and then you will end up maintaining a lot of stuff to make all that work. Uh, but Webmin makes a little bit light of that. All right, so that's enough about the server modules on there. Like I said, they're all extensive. Uh, if you want to know what all the servers are, it supports these. So everything from FTP server, uh, smart drive status, not installed because it's a virtual machine, but yes, it will do smart drive status uh, on here. But all my machines are virtual that run Webmin, so I can't, I don't have any way to show you what that looks like. Um, iSCSI is put in here. Um, Firewall options, so you can play with that if you want to set up a DHCP server, bind server, uh, and a few other miscellaneous things. So there's lots of stuff in here. Oh, I, back to the mail server topic. Uh, it does support spam assassin as well. So kind of novel. So others, command shell. Yeah, oops. Uh, oops, ls. I thought I thought I had ll installed. But oh, there you go. It's just the command shell. It's kind of nice. It just fades in the browser. It's uh, root level command. Oh, okay, it won't, ah, the terminal is a little bit different, so it won't display some things like htop, so it's just for quickly running a command shell. Custom commands, so you can run a custom command on here. I don't really use that if I just, I have SSH. File manager, kind of neat, you can manage your files in here, so uh, we can look for things in the files, copy, upload, and stuff like that. I don't use this. Java file manager, uh, oh, yeah, it supports print clearly a, some deprecated version of Java. I'm not going to turn on. So that doesn't work. Perl modules. Um, because this is based on top of Perl, you can load different uh, Perl modules, protected webmin directories, some different options you can do there. Text login. Oh, OK, this is a full shell. So it does have a shell. Whoops. A little bit of a delay. Let's see how HTOP works. In black and white. Can we turn it to colors? Colors off. Well, it's not showing in color either way. This is kind of a slow update. I'm out typing it. <laughs> so yes, it's in. I never use this. I have SSH. I just log in. Upload, download uh, for getting files uh, in and out of the system for that. And eh, kind of neat. Networking. Bandwidth monitoring. Never used it. Um, set up now. Uh, nope. It looks like there's some more stuff to configure, so I'll have to skip that. I've never used it. Uh, it's got some type of bandwidth monitoring for that system. I look at my firewall for that. So, uh, Linux Fire, this is cool. Set action, accept, uh, default action. You can build your rules inside of here for your systems. Oddly, I use scripts to do this in the command line. Uh, maybe one day I'll do a tutorial on that. Or I have Phil in because he's way better at it. <laughs> he, he helps me with those things. That's how they get written. Uh, network interfaces. This is nice. If you're not familiar with setting up networking. Now, networking on uh, any of the Linux systems, for most part, you have active now, activated at booth. We can change parameters. They don't activate now. So let's say we set a default IP address, and maybe you're not sure how to start and stop networking services. This is kind of neat because it'll let you save it. It'll let you apply it. Um, so you can actually have active now versus active at boot. So that's kind of, if you're not familiar with how Linux networking works in general, when you go through, and we'll, I, I usually use from the command line because uh, it's easier and I'm at the terminal when I'm setting these things up. Uh, so we have our interfaces, whoops. I face E0, and you can actually uh, change it from uh, DHCP and instead I face E0 and put in parameters in here. I won't get into the details of that. Uh, but because I, this is something you probably want to learn from the command line, and if the machine's DHCP, no, whoops, uh, no problem. Uh, if it's DHCP, it's not a problem because um, it's going to just go ahead and grab an address, but sometimes you have to set the address on the machine and you only have access to the terminal and you're not necessarily in because you're configuring the machine so you can get uh, network access on it. So maybe it's take time to learn this, um, how to do that, but you can update, oops, keeping you logged in. Uh, you can change and edit DNS, client name, uh, host addresses, 
add remove it. It's kind of nice because like for the uh, Etsy host file, it just lets you kind of add a new host entry and it fixes the spacing for you. So you don't have to know how to do that. Not that it's hard. Uh, so kind of neat there. This client never used it. Uh, so don't not overly familiar with it. I mean, if you if you don't want to know what it is, it's the network information service. But um, so you can set up queries and the servers kind of can know where they're at. Like I said, don't use it. I don't really use any of the TCP wrapper stuff either. Hardware logical volume management. This is nice because it lets you uh, manage volumes and it can manage RAID arrays. Like I said, don't have any handy here to do, but if you're not familiar with setting up RAID arrays, that is a supported module and that is uh, can be a little bit tricky building a RAID array from the command line if you're not familiar with it or you don't do it very often or you wanna edit or swap out a drive. Being able to do that in here and set up hard drives, uh, pretty nice. I'm familiar with setting it up from the command line, so that's how my preferred way to do it. But understanding the RAID array, if it's degraded and things like that, you may not. And this is a nice way to do it. So uh, and some of my people that are maybe watching this uh, may want to set up a unified system with a back-end RAID array uh, and run on Linux. And you're like, but I don't know the command line for that. This actually makes that pretty straightforward and easy, how to build a volume group um, or how to build a RAID group here. I don't have a RAID array set up in this. I'm not going to for the demo but it lets you handle and create the physical volumes um, and set this up. So it also, if you're not familiar with LVM, helps with that. So it also, here's the uh, partitions, which is cool. It's, this, this was set up in LVM, but if you're not familiar with it, um, that's how you do the logical volume management, but it also handles standard logical partitions as well. So you can add it the partitions. Actually has a wipe option in here. Scary, but you gotta remember your root. So uh, make sure you lock this down because people can just go in here and wipe your hard drive. So all the details are in here for some uh, for setting up the different partition types and how that works. Printer administration in here if you want to man manage printers from the system. System time. Time is so important for running servers. Uh, put a time server in here. I didn't do it because this is a demo machine, but uh, then you set it. Oh, look, it kind of looks like the cron job. Yeah, it wants to run. It'll set up the sync and apply and an automated uh, time on there. If you're not familiar with how to set up time zones in uh, from the command line with the TZ system, you can do it here pretty easily. And then this is the system time, so you can see that it's what time and date it is and actually change it. Um, it's easy enough to type it from the date from the command line. Clustering of servers and change password. This goes back into the way you can cluster the webmin servers together. I don't use this, but you can. Uh, it can find the other servers and you can uh, cluster them together so you can create jobs across all your servers. Kind of a neat management. Uh, maybe if I ever set that up and play with it, I just don't really have a lot of use case for it. I usually look at servers individually. Um, and Ansible is just a better tool for when you start talking about massive server management and, uh, because Ansible uses SSH, it's very secure, and it's the one thing that you can you, you find you leave servers open with. And that's why we have those Ansible tutorials. So if you get into mass server management, you're not as likely to do it through here. So I don't know that I'll do a video on this. And then of course, bottom is refreshed modules and we're back over here, we'll look at the dashboard. And that concludes our my review of Webmin. It's a great tool, I like it. Um, it is handy for especially for those things you don't use very often. I'm really happy with it. Um, and I will address something I think I said at the beginning. People asked about cockpit. I do have it, whoops, turn the caps lock off. To give you an idea for people who wanna know, this is cockpit. Uh, Please note, it's super basic compared to Webmin. So if anyone wants to know, I, software updates, terminal, the terminal is better. Um, it has support for some of the same services and stuff like that, disable, stop. But you can tell when I'm comparing these directly, uh, Webmin, lots of features, lots of modules. Let's go play with Apache and configure it. Here's this. Um, it's just real. I, I don't think it's a bad product. I think it's a super basic system uh, with a prettier dashboard. Maybe I don't know. I even tried setting up with more, th more than one machine. It just lets you flip between them. So yeah, not not real impressed with cockpit. So for those of you wondering, and if, I've seen a couple of people message me about it, say, hey, review cockpit. Uh, it's like Webmin with less features. That's my that's my opinion. Oh, it's I like this layout and design. It feels more. It feels pretty modern, but yeah, Webmin definitely a whole lot better. So I will 
just going to leave that there at the end uh, for those of you wondering and uh, maybe leave the comment in there about that. So thanks for watching. If you like to kind of hear, like, and subscribe, if you have questions about this, uh, let me know. But Webmin is a great tool. Um, it, it works well. It's a nice system. Uh, especially if you're beginning in Linux, it can help you get started. Or if you're like me that you haven't done something in a long time, Webmin can be handy to figure out how to do an iSCSI initiator because I can't remember because I don't, once you set a lot of these things up, they just work almost endlessly. So uh, yeah, handy for that. That's my opinion on it. Like I said, me, I may lose a little Linux cred with some people on that, but uh, seriously, I, I do a lot of different things, so occasionally I do forget uh, little pieces of information. <laughs> All right, thanks for watching. Once again, like, subscribe, leave comments below.